Well, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, uh, Tuesday Night Edition. Our topic tonight is Ocular Disease Interpretation and Utilization of New and Old Technologies. And our speaker is my partner, Dr. Greg Caldwell. He is a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, where he also completed a one-year residency in primary care and ocular disease at the Eye Institute in Philadelphia. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomate of the American Board of Optometry, and a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society, and a member of the Optometric Wellness and Nutrition Society. He currently works in Duncansville, PA, as an ocular disease consultant. His primary focus is the diagnosis and management of anterior and posterior segment ocular disease, and he's been a participant in numerous FDA clinical investigations and trials. He has integrated nutrition, prevention, and wellness into his, pa uh, into his patient care. Thus, he practices full integrative optometry. He is a co-founder of Optometric Education Consultants and co-administrator of OCT Connect on Facebook, which has uh, a very robust uh, following. He has lectured extensively throughout the U.S. and over 13 countries nationally. In 2010, he served as president of the Pennsylvania Optometric Association and served on the AOA Board of Trustees from 2013 to 2016, and he's president of the Blair Clearfield Association for the Blind. So with that, give Greg a nice virtual uh, round of applause and welcome, and we can get started for tonight. Greg, you seem to have lost your sound. All right. Thanks, Joe. I should be back uh, you are. now. And and uh, uh, thanks for that introduction. And uh, one of those 13 countries happened to be Spain and uh, it's 2 a.m. there. So, uh, you know, thanks, Jeremy, for for staying up or getting up or whichever way it is. So um, disclosures. These are my disclosures. This is COPE approved and uh, there's some new rules out there. So I have the statement here where all uh, relative relationships have been mitigated. Um, the highlights that I'm going to point out here is this was independently prepared by me. Um, this again, this is a pretty fun lecture. You know, it's going to be didactic at times. It's going to be introducing new technology. Some of it comes from all these uh, who I've lectured for and these advisory boards and so on and so forth. Again, one of the main reasons uh, that I hop on a lot of these is to kind of stay ahead of the curve. I'm just a private practitioner in Duncansville. But if you know, Phil, if we're going to be educating our colleagues, we want to be able to deliver the most current uh, information. So you can see the list there. I don't have any proprietary interest in any of the companies. Um, I will talk about the scanner tonight. There is a non-salaried financial affiliation, basically because of the, the nutraceuticals that I, I get a, you know, a part of that that I sell. Um, the Involve, I sit as the PA Medical Director, uh, Credentialing Committee, uh, and the Special Units Investigation. I sit on the uh, diabetes and AMD uh, chairman for the healthcare registries. But really, uh, the, probably the most important bullet point is the content and the format of this course is presented without any commercial bias and does not claim superiority over any commercial products or service, especially tonight, since I'm going to be talking about a bunch of these. And uh, with that being said, uh, I think everyone's figured out, Joe and I are the uh, half owners of Optometric Education Consultants, but the true engine behind that is uh, Vanessa up here as our conference administrator. You know, my goal today is to be able to teach, uh, uh, to, to, to be able to have you do something better in patient care. I need to update this. We do have a fifth doctor in our practice. We do have a few more staff members. Here's our building we own. We have six exam lanes, electronic health records, lots of fancy equipment. I probably should have taken the covers off when I took the picture. We have an optical contact lens. My son is as tall as me now. Um, but, you know, basically I'm in private practice like most of you guys out there. So the goal is, again, so you walk into clinic tomorrow if you're seeing patients to be able to do something better in patient care. Uh, so with that being said, the first question that I have out here, the first polling question is, uh, you know, do you consider glaucoma a disease of inflow producing too much fluid or do you consider it to be an mm -hmm. outflow disease? And uh, with that being said, I see, Joe, uh, that you've uh, already launched the handouts. Thank you for doing that. There's two You're in there, uh, full, full slides and six per page. So thank you again, Joe. Is glaucoma considered a disease of inflow or is it a disease of outflow? Mm 
need to turn that warning off. People are thinking through that we got a pretty good, uh, I think we're getting a pretty good response already. So everybody is very experienced with this. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll, share the results. And uh, looks like pretty much the majority has nailed it here. It's a disease of, of outflow. And yeah, you know, I agree with the with the majority here. Um, and this here is, you know, a slide. Joe, I always, Tom, Fredo, 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 Fredo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fredo? Fredo, yeah. Yeah, yep. So, uh, you know, Joe and I both belong to the, the Optometric Glaucoma Society meeting. One of my favorite meetings to go to it gives me like confidence in treating glaucoma, standing at the podium and you know, if you remember, you know, aqueous is produced at the, you know, the ciliary body flows through the pupil, anterior chamber, makes it to the trabecular meshwork. And really that's kind of where that primary open angle glaucoma, that's where that disease kind of, kind of hangs out. And this is actually a, um, a, uh, a, a couple slides here from Tom. And what he's showing here is this is the trabecular meshwork. And if you remember, trabecular meshwork, Schlem's canal, a collector channel, the vena system. And so there's usually like a little bit of a clog. So what he's showing here is that here's your uh, trabecular meshwork, Schlem's canal, and your uh, collector channel. And when you increase the intraocular pressure to 30 in the eye, you can see how that trabecular meshwork herniates up into that collector channel uh, orifice. And what happens when someone doesn't have glaucoma, or what he's showing here is that you can see that the collector channel, when you lower the IOP, you can see how it pulls out and maybe a partial removal here. But what he showed in this case study here that it was human eyes with primary open angle glaucoma, even at a pressure of zero, these herniations uh, uh, kind of stayed in that collector channel that's out there, which kind of, you know, kind of what I wanted to get into with this is, you know, that's why you're seeing a lot of the, um, a lot of the treatments, a lot of the MIGS procedures, they're all targeting or going after the trabecular meshwork, trying to bypass it, cahook dual blade, kind of scooping out the trabecular meshwork. Uh, you put in an eye stent, and just remember, because you're going to, I'm going to talk about an eye stent, but just imagine the, the surgeon putting a, an eye stent in here, but yet the collector channel is still blocked. So you're bypassing the, the trabecular meshwork. Uh, and that's why sometimes, you know, you get a really good IOP reduction uh, with, you know, an eye stent. Uh, and sometimes you don't because it might not be a viable uh, type of collector channel. So I just thought this was kind of a nice slide that he presented. He presented this at the OGS meeting, uh, kind of showing the trabecular meshwork. Again, remember the anatomy, Schlem's canal, collector channel. And, you know, the disease is, you know, part of the, you know, the disease is partly at this area here. And this is from the slide deck uh, of, uh, from ARI. Uh, I am a speaker for on their slide deck for Rocklatan and Ropressum, did some dinner programs in the day. And I thought this was kind of neat. You know, they're showing with some type of you know, scanning electron microscope at 2000 times magnification, you know, healthy trabecular meshwork. And then you can see when there's oxidative stress or cellular damage kind of goes back, kind of tickles my tickles my fancy now because as Joe mentioned, doing uh, some integrative and working with supplements and diets and helping people with diabetes and glaucoma and dry eye, you know, oxidative stress, free radicals, cellular damage. And look what happens to that trabecular meshwork. It's not that uh, robust and healthy and viable type of tissue that occurs. So again, a disease of that, of that trabecular meshwork. And I thought this was kind of neat. This is uh, uh, aqueous, um, uh, angiography before and after an eye stent. And uh, I just thought this was pretty neat. This is a glaucose eye stent showing before and after kind of bypassing. Again, remember the eye stent kind of snorkels its way, pokes a hole through, kind of makes a little tube between the anterior chamber, the diseased trabecular meshwork, getting into Schlem's canal. And then hopefully it's by a viable collector channel. So just we'll just play this video here. I don't think there's any sound. 
and uh, the video will kind of tell everything here. So this is before and you can see after. You know, they're doing some angiography here and basically injecting some dye into the anterior chamber. And again, this is before you can see one collector channel with a little bit of a little bit of a trickle. And then again, I'll play the video for you. And uh, you can see the eye stent is put into place. Whoop. The eye stent is put into place and you can see how the uh, um, how it really gets that aqueous to drain out. There's looks like there's two eye stents been put into place there with the two arrows. And you can see that now we're able to drain that aqueous out of the anterior chamber, then lowering the IOP. So this is uh, you know, another type of MIGS procedure, again, trying to work around uh, the disease trabecular meshwork. This is a hydrous microstent. You know, they kind of, in a sense, poke a little hole and snorkel through into Schlem's canal. And who knows, they might be breaking some of those trabecular meshwork adhesions, maybe pulling out some of those uh, herniated uh, 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 trabecular meshwork into those orifices of the collector channel, maybe cutting it. Maybe some are opening, some aren't. But it's down in this area when I play the video, you'll be able to see now how these veins actually blanch whenever the surgeon has the hydrous microstent and then just basically puts in a uh, balanced salt solution. You kind of can see how it rinses. And you can see the doc that, that gets credit for this. And you can see right there, see how it's blanching as he injects the, the, the solution. And we'll play it one more time. Bypassing that disease trabecular meshwork and getting the those viable collector channels working again. So again, it's just a real reminder of 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 uh, uh, yeah, it's a disease of outflow, and you're seeing you know repressa targeting the trabecular meshwork. You're seeing MIGS procedures. That's what SLT. You're you know we're shooting a laser in there uh, with that. So. All right, so let's do a polling question. Let's do the polling question number two. This is actually two people here, and both of them are 55-year-old men. I'll bring the other one up here. So they're 55-year-old men. One has a 500 micron cornea, and by Goldman applination tonometry has a pressure of 21. What's his true IOP? Is it 18, 21, 24, or you don't know? Um, is that pole launched, Joe? I was trying to launch it, and uh, something happened. Let me try. It. Let me just try that again. And then we okay. have a. And then we have a. Uh, there we go. Looks like it's running. There we go. And then we have another patient, you know, fifty-five, but a six hundred micron cornea. Is the pressure twenty-one? 18, 24, or is it uh, you don't know? So thick cornea, 21, maybe going to 18. Thin cornea, 21, maybe going 24. What are your thoughts? Or is it 21, you don't know? So this was a little bit more thought involved, but people are rolling in nicely. All right, we're up over 80%. Looks like I got let someone in here. So there we go. All right, I'm going to end the poll. I'm going to share the results. And uh, here's what we have. We have you know, on the patient with the 500 micron cornea, um, I'm probably going to, you know, if, you know, if I was grading this, I would accept two answers, right? I'm going to accept 21 and I'm going to accept you don't know. You know, the, the thought process in a sense of a thin cornea, and it was probably easy to indent and it's probably 24 uh, is, is, is don't think that way. 
Um, there's a lot of corneal parameters out there, cornea curvature, cornea thickness, cornea rigidity. One of the main components of influencing and not getting that true intraocular pressure. And if you think about it, when we do Goldman, all we're doing is transcorneal IOP, right? It's transcorneal intraocular pressure. And we're making this huge assumption on one measurement whenever we say that cornea is thin and it's probably easy and dense, and we don't really take it into account the curvature uh, and the rigidity. And the rigidity actually influences the IOP more than anything. And one of the things that I was uh, surprised by was that you know a thin cornea could be rock hard and a thick cornea, 600 micron cornea like we have here thinking, oh man, it's probably hard to indent. Uh, so that's, you know, oh, we got it to, uh, to be 21, you know, but it's probably really 18 um, is, you know, it, we don't know the rigidity. So we're introducing human error. So really, you could just say the IOP via Goldman is 21. And you don't know the true IOP because you don't know all the corneal parameters. And you literally could be introducing human error and saying, okay, your pressure is you know, 20, you know, that 21 on that 600 cornea is 18. And you go, well, you know what, I can lower my guard a little bit. And that pressure could be 24. So Joe, you have any thoughts on that? I know you're, the, you're big into glaucoma. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. We, we don't make any adjustments. You know, when I look at it, yeah, you know, over 600, under 500, that's my range. Over 600, there's a little bit less risk what are we going to call it? Risk of getting worse or developing glaucoma under 500. There's more risk. And it's also important to understand we don't really even know what it means in the general population either because it's not anything that we actually even think about. But I agree with you completely, Greg. We never, you know, we never make those corrections. We don't want to try to add two, subtract three. It, it, it just muddies the water a little bit. Great. You know, and that, Joe, you made up. A, you made a good comment there. You know, what happens if someone comes in and they have, you know, a, an IOP of twenty and a, and a four eighty cornea? Um, we really don't know what to do with that because there really wasn't a study on it, right? Yes. Dick, you know, Dick Bennett at PCO likes to say he's, uh, you know, was the only optometrist. But the good news was I was doing my residency in 1995, 1996 when they were enrolling people. And I got to work with uh, Hillary and Lindsay and Dick and get people enrolled. So I knew the criteria pretty well. Point being is a person with 20 couldn't be enrolled because they didn't have ocular hypertension. So how do we apply something from that study when they couldn't even be in that study? So just be careful think, out there. Uh, yeah, I think, the, I think the safest thing to say is what the World Glaucoma Association said uh, in regards to IOP and pachymetry that a thin, a thin cornea, you're more likely than not underestimating the IOP. And thick, you may be overestimating the IOP. And that's the, the trend, but that's all they say. And they, they won't get into any more specifics than that. And I, I don't think we should either. So just a reminder, this is a talk tonight about, you know, some old technology, some new technologies. And, you know, there's ways to do pachymetry. You can do ultrasonic here. And down here, I'm showing an orb scan technology, which shows the posterior float, anterior float. And then it's an optical pachymeter where it does an optic section and bounces the light off the front of the back, front of the cornea, the epithelium, the endothelium, and then it estimates you got to be careful with optical pachymeters because if there's any edema, you can get some really, really thin corneas. Um, you can use OCT here uh, to be able to measure the cornea thickness. Most OCTs have, you know, a map that shows multiple readings like we're showing here in this one where you can see the central cornea thickness and seeing what's happened. This is actually a patient with Fuchs dystrophy where I'm using the uh, the pachymeter to kind of monitor the patient. You can see they have a little bit of swelling superior. And actually the thinnest part of the cornea is way down mm -hmm. here on this patient uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, with Fuchs. This is actually my eye. I had LASIK in 1998 and you can see my corneas are pretty thin at 431 and 447. I was about a minus 650 uh, uh, myope and uh, uh, you can see here how you can follow patients with, you know, with pachymetry. 
Um, so with that being old technology, this has been a really fun piece of equipment I've had in my, in my practice now, probably for about two years, uh, cornea hysteresis and using the you know, ocular response analyzer. Again, I don't know if there's any other um, instrument out there that does uh, cornea hysteresis. I don't speak for this company, never received anything from them, but it's a pretty cool uh, technology. Um, and just kind of showing that, you know, here's, you know, a good shock and a good strut um, over here. And uh, you can see that this is the same type of bump or whatever bump in the road over on this side in this technology that they're showing. And, and you can see how the, you know, I'd rather be riding in this car versus this car. And the whole idea of, you know, the concept of absorbing energy, that the elasticity, the viscosity, the dampening, you know, comes down to what is hysteresis. And again, you know, what is it or what, 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 what is, what it is not. And, you know, cornea hysteresis is the cornea's ability to absorb, or maybe the eye's ability, at least cornea hysteresis is the cornea's ability to be able to absorb and dissipate energy. And, you know, we always talk about, you know, biomarkers, right? That seems to be a new word that's out there. There's all these biomarkers stepping on a scale every morning before you go to work. That's a biomarker. You're measuring your weight. You know, IOP is a biomarker if you do it via Goldman or whichever way you do it. But, you know, if I said, oh, man, this patient has a pressure of 45. Oh, but their uh, cornea is 650. You know, which one has a strong predictive? You hear predictive biomarkers that are out there. And you're going to say, well, you know, that IOP of 40 is pretty predictive. I'm really not, you know, caring too much right now that that, that, that cornea is 650. And what they're finding is that the cornea hysteresis reading is a really good biomarker uh, for, uh, for following patients with glaucoma. So I do have this in my practice. And what they have down here is, and a, an IOP measurement like 16.5, that's what it would be like on Goldman. Cornea hysteresis, as it says right here, 10.5 is a normal value. I can tell you, you start getting down to sixes and sevens, and that's where a lot of my glaucoma patients are. That low cornea hysteresis is like that, that tire that was bouncing up and down. The, the cornea has a poor ability to absorb the energy, and that cornea hysteresis has been a pretty good biomarker for like a low cornea hysteresis is a good biomarker for, for the risk of glaucoma. And then here, this is actually a pretty, this is above 10.5. So I look at these all day long. This is 16.5 and it's cornea corrected or cornea compensated. And you can see that it's saying, okay, with the ability to compensate, it's going to 15.7. Uh, and the wave score is anywhere from zero to 10. That's your quality score. Uh, that's out there. So these are patients that I just had in my practice. This is what we see all day long. They actually staple this to the uh, to the chart, but we get them entered. And you can see here that you know the Goldman IOP is 11.1, 11.6. You can see a good cornea hysteresis here, 10.5. Good ability. It's that tire that was over there on that on the on the left side that the car you'd be riding in, it's able to absorb that energy. And with that being said, the instrument is saying, okay, 11.1 is actually 9.6 and 11.6 is, you know, actually 11.7 uh, uh, for this patient. Coming down here, you can see here's a, here's an IOP of 26 and 25. I would confirm that with Goldman just to make sure that the IOPs are up. Now this kind of lets me exhale a little bit because the patient has good cornea hysteresis. Uh, in a sense, it's not that six or seven. So you can see here, 26 is really 27 and 25 is, tw is 25. And we got some pretty good wave scans. This, I put this in here too. This is a low wave, wave scan score. You know, maybe you wanna repeat these with a better score that's out there. Jumping over to this patient, you can see the Goldman pressures. We have just slightly lower than average, and you can see what happens with the cornea compensated. This patient here, you know, comes in, and you know, this one here, I probably wouldn't care too much what the corneal pachymetry is. I'd probably put more weight here. Look, patient comes in with a pressure of 22, 22. 
confirmed it with uh, with Goldman. I remember it trying to be like 23. So IOPs 23. Yeah, I did corneal pachymetry. I don't remember what they were. Really did influence me, like Joe said, 500 and 600, 500. I'll scratch my head a little bit more. Ugh, patients at risk uh, at 600 decreases the risk. 550, it's kind of, eh, doesn't really do too much for me. But this 22 now has a great cornea hysteresis and you can see it even lowers the IOP cornea compensated down to 19.3, but that cornea has a great ability to absorb energy. And this one here, I kind of feel bad. I've had this one um, sitting around for the longest time, and I tried uh, to to take the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 print and uh, the, the the different programs and enhance it, but uh, it started to fade on me because it's got that heat treated paper. But you can see, look here, 32 and something like 33 uh, uh, IOP, maybe yeah, somewhere, or maybe 30. Yeah, 32 and 30. And the reason why I say that is because you can see these are low. This is a glaucoma patient. Um, this patient was diagnosed with glaucoma. Look at that poor cornea hysteresis. And look what it's saying the IOP is. So I really like cornea hysteresis. You know, the, the old in this kind of was uh, the, the PAC imagery introducing something new, cornea hysteresis, the ability to, and we did eye care on this patient. This uh, IOP via eye care was 41 and looks like 25 uh, that's out there. So just wanted to introduce cornea hysteresis and PAC imagery. Joe, you know, I know you, you, you know, your passion is glaucoma, you know, any, anything you want to wrap up on with, you know, PAC imagery, cornea hysteresis, any thoughts out there with kind of risk factors? I think coronal hysteresis is uh, an important piece of information. We we don't have it in our in our facility, but I do see the value of it. And what kind of surprises me is that one device has really held on without, as far as I know, any competitors. And I think it's actually a, a fairly robust device that is that is actually very usable. You know, and some of the on the slide decks that I've used in promotional talks and glaucoma, it is included. So a lot of people are using. I think it is actually kind of a, a valuable thing. Now, before you move on, Greg, there is a, a question that came into the chat. Do you want me to read it to you or do you want to look at it yourself? Yeah, I kind of read it while you were chatting. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of want to get your thoughts on it. And, uh, you know, so just so the audience, in case they're listening and not able to see the chat, you know, so is what you are saying is cornea hysteresis properties are correlated with optic nerve connective mm -hmm. tissue properties, low cornea hysteresis and the optic nerve connective tissue mm -hmm. is not to withstand the energy fluctuations as well, leading to increased risk to the connective tissue of the optic nerve. Joe, thoughts on that? And then I'll weigh in. Okay. Um, this has come up a lot, not on the, on the term of corneal hysteresis, but more rudimentarily with uh, corneal thickness. And many a person has got up in the, on the podium and proclaimed that a thin, a thin cornea is a surrogate for a thin lamina. And that's why these thin cornea people get worse and why they develop glaucoma and a number of other things. And they, they, they speak of it pretty definitively. And actually, there, there's really no support behind it. Uh, Yost Jonas did probably one of the, you know, I guess you say only studies that looked at this. And he looked at 111 enucleated non glaucoma in size and thought, found no relationship between lamina thickness and corneal thickness. So I am not going to say that hysteresis applies to anything other than the cornea. And the cornea is able to, you know, rebound from external insult. I don't think we can make that broad leap of faith saying that the optic nerve is the same way and that the cornea yeah, is, a, is a, a surrogate for that. I, I don't feel comfortable saying that, Greg. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, and it's kind of like, you know, pachymetry, right? Mm -hmm. um, when we started uh, the ocular hypertension treatment study, um, I think it was Weinreb that really wanted to have it put in there. So remember, pachymetry was not uh, part of the original OATS. It was kind of added on, you know, shortly after the OATS was studied. And then, you know, people started making those assumptions, you know, thin cornea, thin lamina, blah, blah, blah. Same thing here, you know, Timothy, I wouldn't uh, make that assumption. And that's not what I'm saying, just to clarify for those that are listening, is that, 
you know, it's somehow, some way, you know, related that a, you know, when you measure the cornea hysteresis and it's low, it just, there's, you know, I have people that have six and sevens that don't have glaucoma, but <laughs> the majority of the people that have it, you know, um, um, have glaucoma or the majority of people have a low cornea hysteresis have glaucoma. So there's some correlation there. Maybe someday someone will be able to prove that, but right now I'm not going to sit here in 2022 and say that that's the assumption that we're making. That's a great question. All right. So let's jump on to some visual fields here. And I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. You can tell this is a pretty old case because the patient has taken Travitan, but I just kind of want to pull a lot of these things together. This was a 50 year old woman recently moved to the area. She said, I need followed for my ocular hypertension. I said, great. You know, that was part of that study. This is awesome. I kind of want to follow you here because, you know, we can see how we want to apply that study. Uh, she was diagnosed 18 months ago. She was using Travitan. Um, her acuities were good. Her uh, er externals were unremarkable, slight hyperemia as expected from the Travitan and her pressures were great at 13 and 14. These are her optic nerves and just, you know, real quick, you know, looks like no violation to the isn't rule, large cup to disc ratio, which goes with that ocular hypertension, a large horizontal or, or vertical uh, diameter. Uh, was kind of a risk factor that was part of the ocular mm -hmm. hypertension. And I got the records and reviewed them. And this kind of goes back to what I said a little bit earlier, um, reviewed the diurnal IOPs. And at the doc's office, the IOPs were 16 to 19 and 17 to 20. Anywhere from, they, they did get some early pressures. Maybe those were the 18s and 19s and 20s. Um, maybe a little bit lower in the afternoon, not a big diurnal fluctuation, but yet patient doesn't have ocular hypertension. Reviewed the PAC imageries and they were 505. And I knew the doc, so I was able to call the doc. It was, a, it was a, you know, about two hours away. They moved from that area to my area. And the doc said, yeah, Greg, you know, it's 500 cornea. I, got, I know it's 505, but, you know, we're going to raise those up to, you know, have this little card here and it says 22 or 24, whatever the number was. And now the patient has thin corneas. Now we're going to treat them. They're at, they're at high risk for converting. And, you know, we had a great chat and so on and so forth. And I said, look, this patient couldn't even be in the ocular hypertensive treatment study because they're lacking oc ocular hypertension. But the doc did take this thin cornea and raise those IOPs. The visual field results, we can see here, this is the left eye. This is a 24-2, nice nasal defect. Well, this is supposed to be ocular hypertension. Well, when I go and I look here, you can see these are zero, 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 zero. Looks like a nice little rim defect happening right here on, on the patient. Uh, and it's a mild defect, very localized, coming basically from these spots right here. So again, you know, zero to five mild, five to 10 is moderate and anything above a 10 is a severe visual field defect. And you can see right there is where it's coming from, kind of matching what's on that grayscale. So I always like talking about what mean deviation is and I'm gonna go through these. We just did a visual field lecture and some of you might've been on it, but you can see here that mean deviation just tells us how localized. So when I'm going through this exercise is saying, if all 54 spots were decreased by one, there's 54 spots, mean deviation would be one. If half the spots were two and the other half were normal, it would still be one. And if they were all decreased uh, by, uh, by four, uh, or I'm sorry, if a quarter of the spots were decreased by four, it would still be a mean deviation of one. Pattern standard deviation just tells us how localized. So this is a very mild defect, minus one. Remember, zero is, is, is ground level. And as you go down, you know, minus one, but you can see it's diffusely scattered. So by looking at these two numbers, you can tell what's happening with the visual field. Going back to you know, this patient here is that, again, it's a five and a seven. That five is pretty deep. It's deeper than that one for sure. But you can see here that uh, that seven tells us that it's very localized, again, coming from these few little spots right here. 
All right. So, you know, why is this patient being treated? Again, we kind of already discussed that. I called the doc. The doc said, hey, thin corneas, raised them up, then said 24s and said now they're at high risk and treated them. So we had a chat with the patient and we basically stopped the medication, repeated the visual field. And you can see it. This is how old this is. I now have, you know, GCC, angiography, da 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 type of technology. This was back before then. And so you can see we repeated the visual field. That left eye got nice and clean. These numbers went back to normal. So I used to tease, all right, we stopped the Travitan. And look, the, uh, the, the retina sensitivity comes back. You can see now that this is a mild defect, diffusely scattered. And these points got better just because we had a technician closely monitor, put that lens uh, in, in proper uh, position here. And you can see it was a fairly high lens, right? A plus 650. Got to be careful with those plus 650s, even to the point that I'll even put a contact lens on the patient when we start getting that high and doing their visual field testing. You can see and, that the, you have a question or comment, Joe? Uh, no, continue. I, I'm going to, I'll make a final comment about that case. Okay, great. And right here, you can see we have the nerve fiber layer. Then back, this is before we had GCC. You can see nice and beautiful, this NFI number, nice and low, very symmetric. And you can see the T-SNP map, how perfect it is. So again, this patient was diagnosed with ocular hypertension, which we wouldn't expect nerve fiber layer, but really they don't have ocular hypertension. Um, so the points are, you know, don't backdoor the patients, be careful with those thin corneas. They have to be suffering from ocular hypertension to be part of the study. So Joe, thoughts? Yeah, I think I think your comment about backdooring them in is very important. I'll think about this. You know, they had high teen pressures and uh, let's say 500 cornea. So they adjusted it up and it became 24. Now that patient goes to another practice, they, they relocate and they get records and they say, well, they got a pressure of 24 and there's 500 cornea. So doctor number two, so, okay, we're going to up that. That's going to be 28, actually. Patient goes to a third practice and they get, you know, 500 cornea and records says 28. Well, now we're going to make it 32. And before you know it, <laughs> They're, they're going to be off the scale. That, 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 that's exactly what I mean by, by backdooring them in. Good points. Yep, exactly. All right. So, you know, ask yourself, I was going to put this a polling question, but we just did this a, a, a week ago. You know, what is the mean deviation of a blind eye on a visual field? You know, is it, ask yourself, is it zero? Um, is it zero? Is it above? Is it minus five, minus 12, minus 32, minus, minus 50? And, uh, you know, I did this. I was actually at a lecture. You guys probably heard me say this. I was literally at the podium. And the question came to myself as I was lecturing. I'm like, man, I don't even know what the, what wonder what the mean deviation of a blind eye is. So I couldn't wait to get back home there. I get back to the office on Monday and I walked in and I said to Sarah, I said, hey, go type in age 30 or 35 here. Let the visual, you know, 24-2, just let it run like it's a blind eye. And she's like, hey, doc, uh, bad weekend? Like, what's going on? I said, no, 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 no. I'm like, you know, I'm geeking out here. I want to know what's going on. And you can see that it said minus 34. But you can see, look, minus 34, but look at the pattern standard deviation. That is diffusely scattered throughout the whole visual field. So this 34, you can see it's a, it's a very deep defect totally blind, parametric blindness down to, you know, diffusely scattered. And then, you know, here's what you do. This is what I'd happened whenever I did the, the uh, other, or I changed the age. I said, just do me a favor, do the same thing, but just type in age 65. So going from about age 30 to age 65 minus 32. So basically when I'm treating glaucoma, um, I, I, or treating or looking at a visual field defect, I really never want them to get the minus 32 because that's a blind eye that's out there. So this has stood the test of time. I like doing this to really help people out. You know, people always ask like, you know, how, well, how do you set your target IOP? There's a lot of parameters, right? Cornea thickness, cornea hysteresis, how high the IOP is, you know, nerve fiber layer loss, GCC loss, what's the gonio look like? Oh, there's all these parameters. What do I set it? So this has stood the test of time over the years. I usually don't set a uh, target IOP until I get a 
a reliable visual field. Once I get a reliable visual field and I see what the defect is, I base it off the worst eye. Zero to five, and this was kind of vetted at the OGS probably about seven years now, considered, well, the 24-2, zero to five is mild. Five to 10 is moderate defect. And anything above a 10 is a severe visual field defect. So we just showed that minus 32 is a blind eye. So is 16 half blind? And the answer is no, because it's not linear. It's curvilinear. That's why 10 is a very you know, severe defect. It's a you know, defect that, you know, that causes lots of problems. So what I learned to do now is, is I just do a visual field. If one's minus two and the other one's minus four, Okay, 30% reduction. One's minus two, one's minus six. Moderate, I'm going to do 40% reduction. And, you know, they come in, pressure is 30. They have a minus 10 in one eye and a, hopefully like a four or two or something a lot less in the other eye. I'm going 50% reduction IOP uh, on that patient. And then as we follow them, we can adjust it up or down. So that's a nice little clinical pearl that, you know, I've been teaching it for a while, kind of still stands the test of time in the practice to help me kind of get that target IOP and kind of give me a way to navigate to that's out there. Joe, any comments? I agree with everything you say right there. I think it's really, it's really, uh, really pertinent, uh, helpful clinical pearl. So with that being said, I'm just going to kind of switch and just see here is, uh, do you have any form of wearable diagnostic equipment in the practice? And where I'm kind of going with this is, you know, Maculogics, you know, has, you know, a wearable device. Um, they haven't, uh, I guess they're still out there. Unfortunately, the company uh, is, is shut down and hopefully their instrument gets bought out by another company. Really good technology. That's a wearable device. Um, I think Ollie Eyes is a visual field and maybe there's some other, I'm going to really go when I go to Vision Expo West, dive into some of these wearables. Um, but I've been working uh, closely uh, with Maculogics until, you know, they, they closed down and now Hero, um, uh, working with their device. So wearable. So that's where I'm going. Do you have any wearable diagnostic equipment, uh, in the practice? Yes or no. And it looks like we're caught up on questions and just need a few more to roll in there, guys, that are out there, just so we can get that number up, and then uh, I'll end the poll. Do you think we need another repost in the handout, or are we good? Um, there was a couple of people that came in afterwards. All right, I'll do just it. Throw I'll it up do there it. one more time. All right, so I'm going to share the results, Joe, while you're doing that, and uh, yeah, we're getting there, right? We got about 10 percent of the audience having some wearable and. Kind of like over the years, I've been doing this for 27 years now, so I'm becoming one of the older guys and, you know, used to raise the hand, how many people have OCTs and 10% of the audience and now 70% of the audience raise their hands and now we're seeing with OCTA and now we're starting to see it with wearables and I think wearables are going to be, uh, are going to be cool. I think there's going to, they're going to find a place. I think they're going to develop nicely as they go by. So again, full disclosure, everything's been mitigated. And again, I, you know, from time to time, I do get paid by Hero to do a dinner program or a breakfast program or do a booth, but this is the one I'm most familiar with. I'm not claiming any superiority with any equipment that that's out there. You know, I'm going to go through it pretty quick. I just want everyone to realize that, you know, these, these devices are just not coming out of anywhere. Um, this one is out of Baskins Palmer, the Eye Institute. Their goal was to provide, you know, physicians and patients access to state-of-the-art, accurate, portable technology. They have a platform that's called Revive, uh, and they're using uh, artificial intelligence algorithms. And, you know, they're, in a sense, there's an onboard technician uh, that talks to you. Again, there's lots of, you. even though they're new, still 10 years worth of clinical data, uh, lots of patents, uh, lots of patient trials, and, you know, there's patients out there with visual field defects, so portable, you know, lots of screenings, maybe health fairs, and really with COVID, it was really nice to have us in the practice, uh, because, you know, when we were at the peak of COVID, you know, we really didn't want to like trash a room, three rooms with one patient, moving them through the office. And obviously we would clean them, but if we could keep the patient in one place, we could take the equipment there. That was really, really nice. The question I had is how does it measure up the Humphrey visual field mean deviation 
versus the Hiru. This was their study showing, again, when they're zero, and obviously you get out here, these minus 30s, you can see that it stays pretty close uh, to this, I guess, regression line here uh, that's, that's out there. These were my patients here. Um, I tortured them. I uh, Doing a visual field, you know, this was a patient that you could see maybe they didn't change their fixation. You can see 48%. This really didn't match. I really wasn't sure how well the patient did, but I just said, hey, you know, can I torture you today? I got this new device. I want to see how it works. This was more representative. So here we go. We got a severe visual field defect. Now we go to mild, but you can see how localized and how localized it was. Um, but this is the Hero on this side, same day, uh, same patient. You can see 66 and 66. Here it was at you know, 10 a.m. Um, here it is at 10.35. And you can see the date, February 2nd, February 2nd. Um, this was the oh, this was the other eye right here. Um, this one, in a sense, matched up really nice. You can see 0 0.78, 0 0.72. Yeah, this looked total deviation, a few extra spots. And you can see here that, uh, you know, maybe the pattern deviation is showing a little bit more in the uh, probability plot that's out there. But you can see the printouts are very, very similar. I can tell you right now, Hero doesn't have any guided progression analysis. Maybe that's coming. They, they, it's being, or well, they say it's coming, but it's not out yet. Uh, you can see here, this is another patient. Here's the glaucoma defect that's showing up. You can see the glaucoma defect is showing up. This here was 2.83. Uh, you can see it's very localized. And again, here, here's 3.38, again, localized. So again, very compatible uh, and very comparable. And here was the other eye, clean visual field, 100%. Mine, or this is actually plus, on the plus side, above zero, it's 0 0.63. And this one is just slightly south at minus 0 0.74. Uh, I think that's very, you know, very close. And this was the second eye, so maybe they're fatiguing a little bit. I thought this was kind of neat. This is the left eye here. Um, and you can see that this spot is showing, you know, these four little points and whatever this probability plot is right here, they started color coding it. I think it's less than 5%. Yeah, it's right here. You can see less than 5%. Starting to color code it. This one here is less than 2%. Uh, again, the less than five is yellow. Kind of putting a color representation to it. Again, red here showing less than 1% being normal. So basically it's this printout in this area and then color coding it. So it's this visual field and this turning on this basically type of printout. Um, I'm going to play one of these videos here. Hopefully the sound comes through. Hopefully it works. Joe, let me know you can hear the sound uh, whenever I play it. All right. I'm here with uh, Robert. We just did Good. Hebrew, but before Perfect. this, I Thank tortured you. them with the traditional Humphrey visual field. Robert, you were giving me uh, some uh, insights of, you know, what you liked about the Hebrew, you said it was different, but I'm not going to put any words in your mouth. Why don't you just tell me what you told me? Uh, the ease of operation, the, uh, I'll say the, the, the amount of stress to do it is less. Um, plus you're also looking, uh, around rather straight ahead. The, the optics that you're looking at are in your field of view, left, right, up, down. Um, it, it makes it a little more comfortable. So I'm going to pause it right here. So when you put on the headset, you know, the Goldman Bowl is set for near, Hero is set for distance. So you have a chance to put uh, trial lenses in. Obviously, if someone comes in wearing contacts and they're set for distance, no monovision, have them wear their contacts while doing the, the device. And then, you know, we do the Humphrey visual field, stare straight ahead. Well, this device, if they want to get the superior visual field, then they have, in a sense, the patient look down and they can test it and they can have the patient look up and left and right. So they're changing fixation and the onboard technician, um, don't think this one has a name yet. So the technician that's on board and it's coaching the patient, okay, look up, look down. That's the dynamics that the patients seem to like because they're not being reminded, hey, don't blink, don't move your eye, hold your head, like it's dynamic. And the other thing that I found out is 
both the tests, we go back and look, I should have pointed it out. They're both about the same time, three minutes, four minutes, so on and so forth. But the patients always think that it's shorter. And I think it's because like, oh my gosh, how much do I have to keep staring straight ahead? Don't blink, don't move, da, 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 where they're able to be interactive with this test. And it seems to go a little bit quicker in their mind. Uh, it was much easier, maybe even a little shorter to do as far as uh, the time involved. Um, the only thing I found with it that I thought was uh, a little distracting was I can see light into the, uh, I don't know what you call it, the, 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 it's the headset uh, hood that you have on the headset. I can see light on the left and the right side um, makes it a little distracting. But other than that, it was uh, a much more pleasant experience. Yeah, so if you had to pick between the two, which one would you pick? I'd, I'd take the... Even though this that was one, a little yeah. distracting, you would take that one, right? Yes, absolutely. So I'm going right. to pause that there. Um, and, and the other point is, is that, you know, they, there is a couple little, you know, light gaps in here. I'm sure they're going to work on that, but you have to do this. You can't do it in the total dark. There has to be a little light in the room. And really it's my canisters that are up in the, in the, in my exam lanes. that's causing the distraction. Hey, Mark, how are you? Uh, we just did the uh, Humphrey visual field. And since I have the technology of the Hero headset device, um, I tortured you and had you do both. Um, just tell me your thoughts on the, the headset, the Hero device. We were chatting about it. I just wanted to capture a little bit of this on video. Uh, well, the headset fits very nicely. Uh, it's nothing bulky. Um, the only thing is I would say that as long as you have a darker room, the field is a lot better. Um, following the balls as they change, listening to the commands, very easy to understand. Everything seemed to be very smooth. I didn't have any complications with it. Uh, to me, it seemed like it was a lot better than the old machine being, the old machine being bright, kind of hard. The dots weren't that clear. This one, you can see them a little bit better as you hit your clicker to change when you capture the balls as they move. So you like that dark background? The dark background's a yeah. lot better. The only thing you didn't like was you mentioned the way the headset is right now is you're getting a little glare from some of the extra light. Yes. yes. We can't do this in a, in a dark room, I didn't tell you. So that's the other thing is that it's a dark background and it's a brighter light, they're able to see it. And again, we talked about the the, uh, the lights kind of bleeding through there in a sense. Right. So, you know, the neat thing with this is that it's more than just one device. It has color vision in it. Um, it has the Farnsworth D15 uh, extended test. It has the Ishihara plate that that's in there. Um, so I'm kind of envisioning at some point, you know, this is gonna be patient walks in, they're gonna put the headset on, you're gonna go through some, uh, testing here, um, and that will probably feed right into my uh, my electronic health record out there. Get the color vision. You could do contrast sensitivity. I've been really enjoying this. Patients coming in, um, you're going to hear me if I get to the point tonight. I'm doing the hand scanner, measuring carotenoids, which then tells me that everything's low in the body, just not carotenoids, and we can discuss that at some point. But people are coming in with glare, and they don't have cataracts, and they have a low hand scan, which is correlated to blood, which is correlated to the macular pigment. And then I do their contrast sensitivity, raise their carotenoid scores up, and all of a sudden their glare goes away and their contrast sensitivity goes away. And now I have a way to measure contrast sensitivity in a, in a reliable way in my practice. So that's kind of nice having that. Again, the headset that we're talking about through with Hero has the visual field, has the color vision and contrast sensitivity. You know, Instruments for macular degeneration. You know, I've been doing a lot of lecturing in macular degeneration, and we have, um, you know, slit lamp. We have camera, OCT, OCT angiography, dark adaptation. Uh, uh, we have uh, per, uh, hyperperimetry here, peripheral. Let's see, preferential hyperperimetry. We have macular pigment eval, which you can do with a MPOD, a scanner, a blood test, and genetic testing uh, that's out there. And so what I want to point out is we lost our maculogics, but then Hero is coming with dark, adapt dark adaptation at some point. But with that being said, this needs, this is going to be a little interactive, this polling question. I'm going to launch it. And basically with that being said, with macular degeneration, where is the macula? I'm going to see if this works. Is it this purple, small purple circle, or is it the large blue one? Is this the macula or is this the macula? 
you know, it's kind of which is better, one or two. So I think Colleen has a question here. Uh, since it's a dark background, is it easier for macular degeneration patients to use as well? Uh, that's a pretty awesome question, um, meaning that I haven't put much thought behind it, but as I sit here and think about it, the macular degeneration patients, um, being able to focus distance, dark background. Um, I haven't really done some advanced macular degeneration because I'm kind of playing around with this with my glaucoma patients in the practice but they have seemed to have been able to take this test a little bit uh, reliable. So that's a good point, Colleen. I'll have to keep an eye on that and maybe test a few of my macular degeneration patients with it. So um, yeah, stay tuned on that. As we get these instruments, we find out applications. So. Okay, purple macula or blue macula? Purple or blue? All right, looks like we got a good... Good uh, and okay, we're at 66%. Remember, this is interactive. People, please uh, respond, even if you want to take a guess. I know I don't have the, I'm not sure, but is it here or is it here? All right. All right, let's share the results. And uh, we have uh, about a third saying that it's the purple, and we have. Um, we have about two thirds saying that's the macula. You know, how large is the macula? There's the macula, right? So the purple, what I was showing, it was trying to show you where the fovea is. Remember the macula is two disc diameters uh, in size. So it's about five and a half millimeters going across. So the macula is pretty big. So again, if you had a drusen or some drusen in this perifovial area, then that would be macular degeneration. It doesn't have to be in the fovea. And a lot of the times whenever we're doing these OCT scans, uh, we're pretty much seeing the whole macula whenever you do these kind of these six millimeter scans of the macula. Think about a 5.5, you're capturing the whole macula. So a little drusen way out here would be in the macula. So that would correlate to here or in this section would be maybe up here. So, you know, the macula is kind of big uh, in a sense. A lot of times we think the macula uh, is the fovea and vice versa. So I just want to go through and talk a little bit about dark adaptation, early detection, uh, prevention that's out there. Um, Joe mentioned I'm doing, you know, a lot in the kind of the integrative and functional and, you know, we're good at allopathic and we have studies and double blinded studies and, you know, a lot of times I'll ask people, uh, are mammograms uh, uh, prevention or colonoscopies prevention? Well, kind of, but not really. They're more early detection, right? Get a mammogram, you find a lump and get cancer early. That's great. Early detection maybe prevention from death, but not really it didn't prevent. What can we do to prevent that lump? What can we do to prevent that colon cancer? That's a little tougher out there, right? You have to have kind of a little belief and functional medicine, so on and so forth. But can we detect macular degeneration a little bit earlier? So small drusen, large drusen are not markers for early macular degeneration. We know from the studies and from maculogics basically, and, and the PhD, Dr. Greg uh, Jackson from all the work is that cholesterol deposits build up. And really, if you think about it, cholesterol accumulates and the process unfolds and it's inflammation, oxidative stress, disruption of oxygen and nutrients, and then you get the drusen formation. And what, how dark adaptation works is based on impaired vitamin A crossing Brooks membrane. So we're gonna get down to really a zoomed in look. This is the photoreceptors coming in, plugging into the apex there of the RPE. And then this is all RPE. Here's Brooks membrane choriocapillaris. And, and I'm not sure if I have it tonight, but the mitochondria of the RPE sit down here at the base. The mitochondria of the RPE is the ellipsoid zone. But the disease, really starts down here. It's an outer retina disease. And what Greg Jackson and his crew and the team and other scientists out there have been able to prove is that cholesterol starts to build up here, this oil slick, not allowing 
vitamin A to cross over. And that's important. Vitamin A in the photoreceptor is important to produce rhodopsin. And that's why patients that have macular degeneration, three years earlier, they have dark adaptation and you might be able to intervene or at least get some type of anti-inflammatory medication or some type of supplementation on board. And you can see more stress and you can see more stress to the RPE, not even a drusen yet, right? Not even a drusen. And now you got the drusen formation. So that's the whole idea now is you got these drusen, but we know years in advance, there's oxidative stress, cholesterol building up, so on and so forth out here in the, in the macula. So I'm gonna kind of just animate this clean. This is what I call macular degeneration. This is macular degeneration if you can detect it. You can do, get the drusen formation and then you get the large drusen. We can start detecting early macular degeneration out here. And that's what dark adaptation is. I kind of chuckle at this one. I mean, I would think it was 2013. So this might have been good back in 2013. Fast forward nine years, I kind of chuckle. And the reason I chuckle, it says, you have a few small drusen and there's no pigmentary changes. So we're going to call this no macular degeneration, right? How is it no macular degeneration? That would be this one right here. This is no macular degeneration. And that's why we struggle with, oh, what should we do for these patients? Should we put them on antioxidants? Should we not do with them? What should we do? Lifestyle changes. You know, don't put them in sunglasses. Don't put them on any nutraceuticals. Wait for them to get to the, you know, the A-RED study where it showed where it's intermediate and advanced. I, I don't fall into that. People say it's controversial. I don't think it's controversial. And then we get to medium drusen, and now we can call it early AMD. Right. So think about it, you know, oh, we're going to going to say, well, yeah, we found a lump on, a, on or a polyp on your colonoscopy. Um, but, it, you know, it's no, it, it's it was cancer only on the inside, but we're still going to call it no cancer. It doesn't make sense. This is inflammation, signs of inflammation. It's happening. So the Beckman classification is still referenced a lot, but be careful with that nomenclature of no AMD because this is AMD right here. So there's structure and function testing in glaucoma. Uh, in macular degeneration, we, we have lots of structure tests, OCT, OCTA, we can take photos here. We never really had a dark adaptation. We never really had a function test. And now we do through dark adaptation. And uh, you know, all these other things are just risk factors that are out there like interocular pressure, cornea thickness, cornea hysteresis age, genetic testing, smoking and lifestyle, pigment uh, MAC, MPOD, or carotenoid testing. Those are all risk factors. If they're low, then it's a risk factor for the condition. So dark adaptation started off with this big microwave years ago. And then in 2000, I believe, yeah, it was 2000. That's when the headset came out through Maculogics. And now we have uh, the HERU that's going to be coming out and launching their dark adaptation. And then hopefully Maculogic's instrument gets bought up by a company. But there's lots of studies out there where it shows you can pick up macular degeneration three years earlier by failing dark adaptation. It's that raw deterioration, that vitamin A, that rhodopsin that can't get converted. And there's actually a, a code, 92284. And it has a high sensitivity and specificity that's out there, meaning that when sensitivity says, if you test and you have it, in this case, I'm just going to round up 91, 91% chance that you have it. There is a 9% chance that you don't. So it's very sensitive. And specificity is the same thing, 91. It says, hey, if you pass with 91% chance, you pass and you probably don't have it. Uh, there's a 9% chance that you passed and you, uh, and, you, and you do have it. So those are two high sensitivities and specificities. I can tell you that these numbers were taken on this unit, not the headset. I bet you it's a little bit higher with the headset. That's just a gut feeling. So here was the headset that was by Maculogics here. This was Mark Ketchum. Uh, he was uh, uh, one of the um, um, salespeople, head, you know, U.S., marketer that was out promoting this. This is what it looked like. And you can see Hero is going to be having it uh, the same way. And again, this was the headset for Maculogics. I have this in my practice. Um, it still works. It's still function. I'm still using it. 
Um, they have ways to service it. Um, and I hope some company comes in and takes it over because it's a good device. The whole idea is people that have no macular degeneration have normal night vision. At night, there's subclinical AMD due to impaired uh, night vision that's out there. So as this poll is running, I see that there's a question in the chat box. I'm going to stop sharing that. I'm going to actually turn on five and uh, launch the poll. And this is, do you have preferential hyperacuity perimetry or have you, or who does this testing? So, all right. Oh, no question came in. I thought there was a question. So who offers in their practice, the patient preferential hyperacuity? I offer this to my patient. I don't offer this to my patient. Never heard of this diagnostic test. You know, as these are coming in, Greg, ju just a comment about some of the wearables that you're talking about, such as the Hebrew device and some of the newer uh, th threshold programs uh, on visual fields. We're evolving. You know, I think things are things are getting th things are getting faster, and maybe what one might say looser. The best, you know, program that we've had in terms of visual field was full threshold. I mean, that was really exact. You know, full threshold really told you what was going on. If if there was a, points that were adjacent that were too far out, they go back and and retest them again. And it also looked at short-term fluctuation by re-thresholding 10 more points to see what the inner test variability was, which was, you know, very, very critical in early disease. And that, that was great, but it took so doggone long. I mean, 18 minutes per eye, you know, you know, the, the patient's sleeping, the, the perimetrist is sleeping, nobody's getting anything done. It was just so disruptive. You know, that that's like the 65 Corvette. And now we're getting into a 2022 Corvette and it's still the same car, but you know, it's a lot faster and a lot slicker and a lot more comfortable. And that's what some of these tests are. And I've, I've done the hero uh, myself. I actually do find that uh, to be a pretty comfortable uh, test to do and, and pretty accurate in terms of plotting out what my visual field looks like. So if you think that these things are, you know, they're, they're fanciful or they're not, uh, they're not going to be, you know, utilized. Yeah, you know, we are we are in an evolution in term in, in these diagnostic tests, and in a few more years, we're going to find things. It's going to be it's going to be important that it's going to be comfortable and, and convenient and, and fast. Yeah, and that's that's probably a great great uh, look into the future, and that's why you know Joe and I at Optometric Education Consultants want to start bringing this stuff to you, and not saying you have to run out and jump in and get it, but be aware of it. Next time you're at a trade show, check it out. And um, kind of like OCT, you know, whoever would have thought that 70% of the practices would be having it. And then Brad asked the question, in dark adaptation, can you speak to the effect of cataracts? And that's a great question, Brad. Um, the, the short answer is cataracts do not affect dark adaptation, right? So that's the confusion. Doc, I'm having trouble seeing at night. Um, is it it's glare from the car headlights? Um, glare is different than dark adapting, right? So dark adapting is the bleach, you know, you get bleached by a bright light and we should actually dark adapt pretty quickly. It's actually kind of neat. You know, when I first started uh, working with the company, I was doing dark adaptation and um, my dark adaptation scores, they weren't pathologic, but they were in the four minute, five minute range, four and a half minute, five and a half minute range. Now that I'm supplementing and built up my, in a sense, you want to say my macular pigments, all my carotenoids, full retina in and out, I'm down to like two minutes. Boom. I correct. My night vision is awesome. I love it. Um, so, Brad, so Brad, basically cataracts don't affect dark adaptation. So if you have a patient has cataracts, history of AMD, trouble seeing at night, you can run dark adaptation on it. And if they pass, it's probably the cataract. If they fail, it's probably a combination of maybe some AMD, maybe some you know low carotenoid levels or full antioxidant levels of the retina and the cataract causing the problem. But cataracts do not cause dark adaptation problems. Glare problems, yes. 
All right, end the poll and share the results. And uh, we can see here that uh, majority of the patients haven't heard, or majority of the audience hasn't heard 50%. And we have 50% or 47 that don't. And a small percentage too, and I have offered this to my patients and I have a few of my macular degeneration patients being monitored um, right now. So let's talk about the test. Um, you know, we're looking for to be able to find those patients converting to wet macular degeneration. And we've all had these patients that, hey, you know, you got these drusen in the back of your eye, you're good, I'll see you in nine months, here's your Amser grid, so on and so forth. And then they come back in nine months, and maybe they didn't even notice they bled, or they call you in four or five months and they bled, right? <laughs> so we're trying to be able to catch these patients as early as possible, because we do know that if we catch them early and get some on, you know, get the uh, Avastin on board or the ant or the uh, anti VEGF on board. Not saying Avastin is the only one we use, but get some anti uh, VEGF on board. We can maybe preserve some vision. So here's the No Tell Vision. This is the 4C Home of uh, uh, product that's out there. Basically. Optometrist, really, uh, ophthalmologist, any eye care professional, really doesn't make any money off this. There's not another piece of equipment that you have to, to use. I do this in my practice. I have a portal. I go in. I put all the patient's information in. The, 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 the key here is in the eye that you're testing. So you can do unilateral or bilateral. They have to be 2060 or better and have intermediate or worse drusen or, or macular degeneration. So they have intermediate. Um, you just basically prescribe this and the company takes care of the billing, the shipping, the training uh, that goes on with this. So kind of a neat home monitoring. I don't think the company likes whenever I say it, but it's kind of a Amser grid on steroids is what it in my mind is. Um, again, preferential hyperacuity perimetry. Um, Medicare covered, um, kind of a loose statement here. Um, I can tell you that like in my area, it, it is covered, but there's no policy. So then it breaks down on the Medicare Advantage, but keep prescribing because that's how things uh, get done. So again, this is what we're doing. We're following this patient with Drusen. And what we're trying to do is catch them as early as we can when they bleed and, and then um, get them off to the retinologist. So what happens is when they're being monitored, what happens is uh, you get an alert the company gets an alert. And when it goes above a threshold, you know, kind of everyone's alerted and until the patient gets into the, into the practice uh, that's out there. And this slide always seems to slow my, uh, so this is how it works. Remember it's preferential uh, 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 hyperacuity perimetry. So what happens is there is a bend in the line. So what happens when they present it, where the bend is, is where the patient should click. But if they click somewhere else, that might be a sign of metamorphopsia or the patient is having a choroidal neovascular membrane. So it's then, so we know where the bend should be, but if a patient keeps reporting elsewhere and it's outside the threshold, and that's whenever we and the company get alerted to get the patient back in. So as you can see here, it doesn't go this fast, but you can see there's a bump in this line and that's where the patient would, would click where there's a bump. And if they click elsewhere, then there's probably something else going on. And they've already been threshold in, in, at the first two weeks before any alerts go out. So they kind of know if the patient has drusen, where they're kind of lumpy and bumpy, and then they can start the test and monitoring and pick up and find out. And what happens is whenever they find something, then it can actually quantify it. And again, you know, it helps with, uh, uh, with with the with the you know the call back uh, to the office uh, and following the patient. So you know the whole idea here is you know, here's a patient in 2017 and they were given uh, you know the the monitoring system. They've already had a trend score. Uh, this is a 86 year old male or an 86 year old man. Um, when Dr. Gray was uh, teaching back at PCL, he was a neurologist. We used to go and present to him and say, oh, I have a 86 year old male, he'd say, male what? Male pig, male giraffe, male. He goes, they're humans, man, child, woman. So I try to, he, since he's passed, I try to change him to, here's an 86 year old man. He has 20, 30 vision, able below that 2060, able to be monitored. And the whole idea here is they're being monitored. 
And you can see right here, they cross that trend line. They've already been in a sense trended or baseline and the patient was alerted and you know they started here and they came in and they had this and this is was the trend this was their lumpy and bumpies before and then you could see that this was picked up and then they were starting to get a cord on the avascular membrane so this is kind of some neat technology which i started to implement in the practice i just have a little snafus but work with the with the company. Um, the, I'm in Pennsylvania, and I have a lot of Medicare Advantage, and we're working on. I'm the third party chair, trying to to resolve some of that. All right. So Peter writes: Is organized optometry doing anything to reduce the visual stress caused by excess uh, brightness of new vehicle lights and reduction recovery time, especially for seniors? And that's a great question. Um, I did a lot of organized optometry over the years. I was president in 2010, uh, 2013 to 16, served on the AOA board. Um, I, I still serve as a chair and help with PAC and legislative stuff in Pennsylvania. I'm not sure, Peter, without all that being said. Joe, any thoughts on that? Have you heard anything with his question? I've not heard anything, but there's it's kind of, I think, uh, a dual issue in terms of the lights. I'm going to look at I'm going to look at his question again. Well, they're, you know, they, they are, they are different quality lights. They are bright. Also, one thing to consider is the fact that a lot of cars are bigger cars. They are they're SUVs and trucks and the lights just by nature sit higher. And uh, they are, even if they're not brighter, they're often, you know, shining into the, the eyes of the person who's driving a, 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 an automobile as opposed to an SUV. But I, I don't know that organized optometry is actually looking at anything uh, as far as that goes. So, so thanks, Peter, for the question. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, and then we got some things that we can wrap up with here. I see we're sitting at about 923 uh, Eastern time. Uh, treatments for macular degeneration, you know, early detection, meaningful treatments with significant mm -hmm. value don't cure, but have been shown to slow the progression. Uh, not limited to early stages, but all stages of AMD, right? So I want to wow. point out, we always talk about smoking um, and sensation programs. You know, what happens there when you smoke is your body triages, right? So your body's always triaging. That's why, you know, a lot of patients, um, you know, they have low, they have osteoporosis because remember, you know, calcium uh, is in the neuromuscular junction to help you know, with the muscle firing. So is it more important if a bear comes for you to be able to run away or to have a strong bone? Well, the body says, well, I'd rather you run away. So it uses calcium in that neuromuscular junction. And so, you know, that's why a lot of us end up with osteoporosis, our body triages. And so what happens when you smoke, you know, I see it a lot. I travel and I've been watching people, you know, they go and they have this great breakfast you know, they had their blueberries, they had their, you know, their yogurts and, you know, and maybe a few eggs and stayed away from all the processed stuff and so on and so forth. And then they go out and they have a, you know, have a cigarette. And I'm not picking on anyone out there that smokes because I know it's a tough, uh, tough habit to break. Uh, it's easier said than done. But, you know, what happens is when you smoke, your body triages and it says, you know, you know, that person who just had that great breakfast all those antioxidants, all those vitamins that should be going to help your cell membranes and all the different cells. And you inhale that cigarette and your body goes, whoa, let's go and now stop the cell protection. Let's go take care of these toxins. So that's why it depletes the serum antioxidants, decreases pigmentary density for the sense that it can't go in and, and act as a reserve there. And that's why we talk about lifestyle changes, you know, diet and exercise. And we probably can add a lot more to that by getting proper sleep and meditation and so on and so forth. And then you have your disease management, your cardiovascular, your diabetes, obesity, and cholesterol. Those are in a sense, all oxidatively stressed diseases uh, that are out there. And that's why we want to keep those as tight as control, because if those are out of control, now we have you know, not the nutrients going to take care of what they need to go take care of. They're going to, you know, uh, you have that low grade burn, go that low grade inflammation in your body. So, you know, subclinical and substructural AMD, 
you know, I love this. I took this from someone's slide, you know, controversial flourishes. To me, there's, there's no controversy. When you see a failure on dark adaptation, tiny drusen, it's macular degeneration. It's inflammation. It's broken. So there's no controversy. Do something. Interact. You know, you don't have to certainly don't use a reds. That's too high. And a reds is very limited. You're talking, you know, things that treat the inner retina. You want things that can treat the outer mm -hmm. retina. So my point is intervene. You know, part of it would be uh, uh, light retina light exposure, sunlight. Make sure they're wearing sunglasses. Uh, you know, closer follow up. That's a treatment. And then don't forget that low vision and vision rehab is another type of treatment for our macular degeneration patients. Just kind of want to point this out to you. I'm very, very particular um, because people like the allopathic docs like to be, and I'm an allopathic doc. I'm also, in a sense, functional where I become yeah. complementary and integrative. Here's a patient in September 2029 or 29th. Here's going nine months later to June uh, 23rd, comes in with these drusen. This is macular degeneration. It's not intermediate. It's not advanced. Can't use AREDS. And even if you read all the papers because of the high zinc that's in it and all the high vitamins that are in it, don't do it. So what do the people, what do the allopathics double-blinded study? Well, can't do anything. Controversial flourishes. It doesn't flourish. Look, this is the same cut. You've got this little bugger showing up here, this blood vessel, same part of the optic nerve. You can even see this kind of little RPE scar. I'm at the same cut. Drusen, drusen, drusen. I put them on things that treat the outer retina along with the inner retina, carotenoids, inner retina, resveratrol, quercetin, treating the outer retina, and we start getting drusen to reverse, right? Uh, that's pretty cool stuff that's out there. I'm not the only one that's out there reversing drusen. There are other docs out reversing drusen. How about this one? Look at the date here, September uh, 21st, 2020. Yes. Here's April. Look at that. Same optic nerve, same cut. Drusen, drusen gone. Okay, or, or reversed. There's some drusen right here still out in this area. And how about this one here? So again, same cut look. This little hyperreflective area, hyperreflective area, follow the nerve, follow the nerve. This hyperreflective part of the nerve, you can see I'm very particular about getting the same cut. This is an RPE scar, right? This is oxidative stress. This is a drusen, drusenoid PED, drusen. There it was, this one, this one. Here's that scar, here's that scar. So pretty fun stuff. Now, am I reversing it on everyone? No. Um, do I think that genetic testing, I started doing genetic testing. I'm going to start looking at the arms. I'm going to start mm -hmm. looking at the complement factor threes and H's and seeing if this and the other patient and the other patient have something in common. Maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree, but my point is this is AMD. This is AMD. This is AMD. Why is it controversial to intervene with lifestyle, sunglasses, dietary changes, supplementation, because it's inflammation, we could be um, treating it. A few things I want to point out is oxidative medicine and cellular longevity. I just got this. This is from 2019, the health benefits of polyphenols and carotenoids. You know, I think the key is, is that when we test, if you're doing macular pigment testing or serum testing or the hand scanner, you know, I think we miss a boat on these instruments that oh, you scored low, your carotenoids are low. Oh, it just happens that you're just low in carotenoids or you think that you're low in everything else. And the studies have shown out there multiple times, we can study carotenoids pretty easy through blood tests, through you know macular pigment, through hand scanner, skin uh, scanners, RON and resident spectroscopy, other types of instruments. The key where we miss the boat is when you're low there, you're pretty much low in everything else. And then what we wanna do is kind of just go and replace them just with you know, lutein and zeaxanthin. But you can see here, oxidative medicine and cellular longevity, we're pointing out here that they probably have a synergistic effect when it comes to age-related eye diseases, mm -hmm. that they're augmenting, right? You got the whole support, you got the whole team going on. Here's another one here with resveratrol. I'm a big resveratrol, Stuart Richer from the, 
the uh, Optometric Wellness and uh, Nutritional Society. He was the founder of it, big on resveratrol because of the mitochondria environment uh, regulated by levels of some anti-inflammatory mediator, cytokines, kind of sounds like dry eye guys, right? Cytokines uh, modulating lipolysis. And then look at this one. Furthermore, resveratrol maintains the vascular fitness through its antioxidant. Other than other hand, it's relevant in blocking uh, formation of new blood vessels and inhibiting VEGF. Now, what do we mean by complementary optometry? Am I not saying, am I saying, hey, don't go get your VEGF. I'm going to treat you with resveratrol, quercetin, catechins, all these antioxidants, all these polyphenols, flavonoids. No. I'm going to complement, I'm going to integrate this kind of natural along with the allopathic. And we get some really cool studies that are out there. And another one of the uh, nutrition, the annual nutrition magazine, blah, 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 blah. I lost the reference on this, but it might be coming up. It basically says the measurement of carotenoids can impact the clinical practice and the evaluation of macular pigment may eventually become an integral part of the comprehensive ophthalmic exam uh, that's out there. So polling question number six, and I think this will be the second to last one, is I measure carotenoid levels via some diagnostic instrument in my practice, yes or no? Could be through, you could ask for a blood test. You could be monitoring that way. You could be doing an MPOD, the, the macular pigment optical density. You could be doing the hand scanner that's out there. Um, are you measuring carotenoids? And that was a quick one. People like that question. That was an easy one. So I'm going to end the poll. And you can see that you know over 90% of us are not. That's out there. And I'm going to, you know, Chris, uh, Putnam um, just returned from Qatar. He was out serving. He's a great lecturer. He's back in the States and he's got his PhD. So he and I geek out over this whenever we go to conferences. And I said to him, what's the best way to get you know, macular pigment density score? And he said, macular biopsy. And he kind of waited for me to process. And we both kind of laughed, like who's going to do a macular biopsy. But you know that's the best way of doing it. But there's clinical ways. You got subjective ways and you can see the companies listed here and we have all these neat little pictures uh, that are out there some are very expensive some you have to sell a certain amount of nutraceuticals to get the device um, this is where i kind of gravitated to is i love the hand scanner really has improved my health and i dove into the science um, this was developed by the national institutes of health then developed by uh, the uh, university of utah using uh, Nobel Prize winning Raman spectroscopy, uh, and it actually measures the skin. And it's actually a biomarker, right? And it could be a predictive biomarker. Stuart Richard believes that, you know, that carotenoids along with like homocysteine and uh, hemoglobin A1C, those are biomarkers of like maybe inflammation going on in your body. You can see there was a 10 year study uh, by, uh, by Yale. And it's a nice test. Really simple. Uh, uh, the physicist uh, Raman was probably going to turn over by saying really simple, yellow and blue make green. But 748 comes out of the instrument, goes into your hand, carotenoids are yellow, and it, that 748 blue light resonates with a very specific green light coming back at 518 and it measures it. So that's a pretty cool way. Lots of studies have validated it. This was pretty cool. Someone sent this to me that you know goes to Arvo and said, "Hey, look, there was a study done, and um, by these guys here, you know, Paul Bernstein, Werner, and and, and others, uh, in May of 2016, where it says the hand scanner um, is you know really reliable for measuring, and it correlates, right? You have to have that belief that this is correlating to what's in here, and it's been shown that what's in your hand." can measure really anywhere in the skin, but this is a nice little fat pad. It's re re reliable, reproducible, but it correlates with serum and it correlates with the macular pigment. But what I want to point out is, you know, what I've learned a lot and it's been fun over the years is that when we do like fatty acids, EPA, DHA, the omega-3s, 
that's what we lack. Remember, omega threes and omega sixes; those are essential. We, omega nines we get plenty of. Omega sixes we get plenty of. We don't get enough omega sixes. I'm sorry, omega threes. That's EPA, DHA, your flax seed. But we really want to get them from fish, and a lot of us don't eat a lot of fish. But if you remember, those are fatty acids, and that's what this phospholipid bilayer membrane is. By having the proper ratios, and that listen to what I said, the proper ratios of three, six, and nine. Now you got your cell membranes that are ready to be laced with these nutrients. And if you remember, uh, vitamin E is fat soluble. So your cell membrane better be ready to take on that vitamin E. Vitamin C is water soluble. So it goes to the outside of the cell and to the inside of the cell. So this would be the interstitial space. This is inside the cell, really doesn't build up in that cell membrane. But there's a lot of other vitamins that are fat soluble, you know, beta carotene and lycopene, those are fat. So this is a cell now that's really is ready and protected from those antioxidant or those free radicals protected with antioxidants with the free radicals that come in with all those diseases that we're very well aware of that's out there. So I just want to show you how I put this to application and then we'll move on to to a different technology for the last few minutes. Um, this is a 53 year old man, right? He comes in, mom has a family history with uh, 43 injections or dad has 43 injections in his eye. He's pre-diabetic and when I'm going there with that, metabolic stresses, pre-diabetic, oxidative stress, 20-20 vision, we did everything on him. His retina was clear, his OCT was normal and he passed dark adaptation. And he said, doc, is there something I can do? And I said, huh, I got something for you. And I measured his carotenoid scores. And yeah, you know, this is an A plus. This is an A, B, C, D, E. He scored right here, 26,000. Like most of my Altoona patients, the sad American diet, right? Standard American diet, sad. Standard Altoona diet, sad. Chicken wings and lots of processed food. He scored right here. And I said, look, if you know what I know, I'd probably get your score up. So we placed them on, you know, a lutein. Everyone wants to focus on lutein. Oh, it only has one milligram. Right. It only has one milligram. Got it. Thank you. Got him. Good. So we have this, we got this uh, patient that, uh, you know, we got this supplement that only has one. You only need one when you have all the other supporters. That's called synergism. So you can see here, resveratrol, all these other quercetin catechins, all this polyphenol, flavonoid, got all the A's, blah, blah, blah. And then he wanted something else. So we went with some fatty acids and we want some D3 and K2. And then you can see, you know, astaxanthin is a big one. Some more lutein, uh, uh, coenzyme Q10. And I usually don't do this because skin turns over in 90 days. But uh, his, his score went to 33,000. I said, all right, you're coming back in one month. And he went to 47,000. So he went from 26 to about 33 and now 47. And he changed his diet and he's eating leafy green vegetables and bullets and stuff like that. So now maybe we helped him stage off some of that macular degeneration. So you can do things in the practice uh, that are out there, like reverse these small drusen, or at least calm down the inflammation uh, that's in the body. All right, enough of that. Let's shift gears on keratoconus here. And I don't see any other questions. All right, keep it in time that we have about maybe 10 or about 10 minutes, 15 minutes here. Uh, we'll go through keratoconus. You know, keratoconus, this is advanced keratoconus and you can see it uh, pretty easily. You can see when the patient looks down the Munson sign, um, the, the lid is taken on the shape of the cone. What I like pointing out with technology is um, that keratoconus is a posterior surface disease. And if you're going to be looking for, you know, form frust keratoconus early, you know, frustrated forms of keratoconus form frust stage one, um, you want an instrument like corneal specialists always have something that can image that posterior float. And then if the care, if that posterior float gets bad in the ectasia, it starts to affect the anterior float. And then you have, you can see what has happened to the keratometric readings. And here's that optical pack imagery that we talked about. That was the right eye of that patient. This is the left eye. Again, 
posterior disease, ectasia, balding forward, creating a disease of the, ant, of the anterior surface. And we can see what's happened. And we have a cornea here that it's able to be measured at about 342, but it's probably even thinner down here where the tip of that cone is. So what happens when the posterior surface, right? So remember that um, keratoconus is a disease of the posterior cornea. It's bulging, bulging, and bulging. And then Decimase membrane is being stretched and it ruptures. And aqueous pours in, you get cornea swelling. What is that? And that's a very painful condition called high drops. And then what's going to happen eventually is that you know, the, 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 the endothelial cells will slide over, cover that area, pump out the fluid, but then the patient ends up with a scar. And that's why a lot of people that have high drops end up with a corneal transplant. But, you know, can we do something a little bit earlier? Can we intervene? And we're going to talk a little bit about cornea cross-linking here. You know, we know that keratoconus is progressive. You're hearing a theme tonight, dark adaptation, early detection, so on and so forth. We're now uh, able to do some genetic testing with keratoconus. I just got a few kits today. I had a whole family come in. I want to do the kind of test them and then get my mind wrapped around that. And maybe we'll have a genetic test uh, testing lecture towards the end of the year. But we know that it's progressive. And, you know, obviously the companies out there is like, oh, we used to think it's one in 2000. Now it's one in 400 blah, blah, blah. You know, with the early detection, which probably more keratoconus than we're aware of. But before it was glasses and rigid contact lenses, and he had some specialty contact lenses, maybe putting in some intact, some intrastromal rings, and then when they got bad enough, a corneal transplant. But we really didn't have anything that could stop the progression. And now we do you know, there were things that were non-FDA approved, but now there's an FDA approved procedure out there, you know, called cornea cross-linking. And with that being said, um, you know, the, the, the watch out, the, the potential signs are refraction or increase in the refraction or the increased change of cylinder, the reduced best corrected acuity, frequent headaches, halos or ghosting, you know, without cataract, you know, they're kind of getting that double image, that irregular astigmatism, creating that ghosting. Family history of keratoconus, there goes that genetic, that excess eye rubbing, difficulty seeing at night, maybe passing dark adaptation uh, because keratoconus is not going to create a dark adaptation problem and then increase light sensitivity. So the key is, you know, now that we have a treatment, um, it was great to find it earlier, but then, okay, we'll send you to wherever and they're doing this non-FDA treatment. And some patients didn't like that. Some patients did, but now there's a, uh, a, uh, a way to do it. And what happens with cornea cross-linking is they remove the epithelium and they soak it with riboflavin, which is vitamin B. And this is kind of neat. I'm going to talk about this in a second. And they check for flare. They're checking for flare in the anterior chamber. And they're literally soaking that riboflavin uh, for about 30 minutes, checking for flare. And once the cornea thickness measures properly in the flare and you know, 400 microns, they basically turn on a UV light. And you know, if you want to say barbecue it for about uh, 30 minutes. Now, Think about what we've been trying to talk about with macular degeneration. We've got oxidative stress. We got all this low grade inflammation. You know, that's with, with these, with our diets. And that's why the autoimmune and maybe leaky gut and all that stuff and how it all ties together. Here, we're taking riboflavin and ultraviolet light and hitting it for 30 minutes, basically aging the eye or the cross-linking, like when people are out in the sun, you ever see those pictures of, you know, someone that's never been out in the sun and they're 90 years old and they look like they're 40, but you see someone that's 60 years old, been out in the sun, all the wrinkles, that's cross-linking that's occurring. And those are kind of hard to break those cross-linking when that occurs from that sun damaging. So what we're doing is when you take that riboflavin and hit that eye, we're doing the opposite of typically what we want to do to the body and aging it instantly or aging it that day after hitting it for 30 minutes. So 
kind of taking something that's in a sense, usually bad for our body and turning it into good. So that's kind of a kind of a neat way uh, that's out there. Um, with that said, I'll just talk about amniotic membranes and then we'll just wrap up, wrap up there. So I just want to talk about amniotic membrane history. Amniotic membranes were talked about in the 1940s. Um, 1995, Kim and Sang used uh, uh, amniotic membrane tissue for uh, ocular surface reconstruction. And then in 1997, it was first in the United States, but it was sutured and surgical. And then it was in 2005 that uh, biotissue came out or the, or the cryo, cryo preserve came out in 2005. And then about seven or eight years later, a few of the dehydrateds came out. Now, what I want to talk about is adult wound healing. Adult wound healing is different than fetal wound healing. And when we get a cut, we get platelets and neutrophils and macrophages, and then that recruits lymphocytes and fibroblasts, and you have inflammation, proliferation, and then you get a scar, right? We're very familiar with kind of that adult wound healing, but do we want to regenerate or do we want to repair? We want regeneration. Repair is a scar and regeneration is putting back the original cells. So when you have a cut, you don't want a scar to form in here. You want it to go back to the original tissue. And that's what amniotic membrane and some of these true biologics can, can do for us. So right here, the amniotic membrane, it does come from the, uh, from the placenta. It's not like these companies hang out and say, hey, it looks like you're going in and going to be delivered. Your water broke today, right? We're going to, you know, 25 bucks. Can we have your placenta? Um, these are planned C-sections, right? So planned uh, C-sections, uh, uh, and there's a lot of testing that go on. Uh, so these are very, very safe uh, membranes to use. Um, what we want to do is prevent, prevent hazing and scar formation. You can see down this side, we have inflammation, keratocyte activation, scarring. Over here, we can intervene with, uh, with an amniotic membrane. So there's different ways you can enter, like I've been using it for neurotrophic keratitis for quite a few years. Now we have Oxervate to be able to do that. We're going to run out of time to talk about Oxervate, but you can use Oxervate with, uh, with an amniotic membrane. Uh, infectious keratitis. Patient comes in with infectious keratitis, nice hypopion. You can put an a amniotic membrane. And I'm going to tell you right now, I would probably do a Prochera and I'll show you why here uh, in a second. A lot of times I can't get Zergan because it's in a warehouse somewhere and there's something over the cornea hair over the pupil like this dendrite, I will use uh, a Prochera in an infectious or a cryopreserved in an infectious keratitis. Filamentary keratitis, really bad dry eye. I like to treat the underlying dry eye with, with an amniotic membrane and you can see before and after and it usually keeps those membranes, those filaments away for about six to nine months. So the, the rheumatoid arthritis patient that comes in, has a really bad dry eye, gets those filaments, put the amniotic membrane on there, let it kind of heal that ocular surface, and the patient will st start to come back in about nine months. You can put another one on. I really found that to be helpful. In recurrent corneal erosion, um, I found that to be helpful. Sake of time, I'm not going to play these videos. This is just someone that's scraping away uh, at the eye and it's how hard it is to get the epithelium off. This one here, I'll play for real quick. You can see that there's an abrasion. This over here, the guy, the surgeon's grinding on the eye. It's hard to get off the epithelium, but you can see this is EBMD. And uh, you can see here that the epithelium comes off really, really easy. That's just a really bad diseased uh, cornea. So you, we use it a lot after Salzman nodule removal. The surgeon removes it in the operating room. They come in and I'll put an uh, amniotic membrane. You can use it for chemical burns. You could use it for stem cell burnout. I think this is kind of cool. Stem cell burnout. I see this quite a bit in those kind of planned replacement monthly lenses using disinfectant solution, higher prescriptions, lots of reasons that this limbal cell gets damaged and produces, for lack of a better term, crappy epithelium. 
kind of this is amniodarone, kind of showing how the cornea heals. And you can see right here, there's where the bad epithelium is because of the limbal cell exhaustion. Look, limbal cells producing bad, uh, and again, multifactorial, monthly lens, thick lens, high prescription, mechanical crushing, multi-purpose solution, stuns that uh, limbal cells creating uh, an issue. So, you know, amniotic membranes, they're natural, have a lot of nice growth factors in them. And uh, I'll show you inserting it, and then I'll just show you a little difference of, of it, and then we'll wrap up. Let me play this video. It's a quick video here. Uh, here I am rinsing it. So there's this right here. Popping off the productive value. You want to rinse, rinse, rinse. You want to get off the ciprofloxacin, the amphotericin B. Look down. Look down. Stick it up in the upper sulcus. Look up. Look up. Pull the lid down. Boom. Okay. And then I put a tape torsorophy on the eye, uh, which is pieces of tape that goes right on the lid crease. It de decreases it. the mm -hmm. uh, blink rate, um, and it helps keep the membrane uh, uh, intact there. So this is what I want to point out, um, is that this is a dehydrated. And this is right off their package insert. And it says right here, should not be used in the presence of active infection, right? So right there in their package insert, Procara is actually indicated. And if you look at the FDA uh, approvals out there, a dehydrated is wound covering and cryopreserved is wound healing. And I can tell you that I've done enough polls and enough live and enough polls live and it and at these webinars that people think that these membranes are the same. They are not. There is definitely a difference between cryopreserved and dehydrated uh, that's out there. So, you know, Oxervate is used for neurotrophic keratitis. We're not going to be able to talk about that tonight. Maybe we'll sneak it into another lecture that's out there. A couple of uh, very important questions, though, I think would be good to, uh, to end on with Greg. Okay. From Timothy and Colin. Did you see them? Do you want me to read them to you? Um, I didn't see them. While that's happening, I'm going to uh, just, I'm going to put this poll up here. Just curious. Mm -hmm. um, I at least warned one diagnostic pearl. So I'm going to stop sharing that. And uh, let's get that launched. And we'll let that run, Joe, while we're answering the questions. What What is the approximate cost of the amniotic membrane? Yeah, the cost depends on dehydrated versus um, cryopreserved. Um, I know if you buy cryopreserved, like at a bulk and you to work with the company, um, I, I haven't uh, worked and bought, I mean, we buy about nine or 10 at a time whenever we buy them. I know we get them at a discounted rate at that point, but let's just say $800. And dehydrated is, you know, I've seen them as low as $99 specials. I've seen them like two or $300. And the reimbursement, because it's the same CPT code, um, it's the same. So if you're going for profit, obviously, you know, you want to go with the, the lower membrane, but you're not getting the same uh, biologics that's in there. Remember, that's the key. There's a lot of healing process. The two that you need to know, and I didn't talk about it tonight, but if you want to read up about it, what happens in the cryopreserve uh, procedure, Pentrax in three and heavy chain hyaluronic are super important in healing and, uh, and regenerative healing. They get lost in the, de in the dehydrating process. So the cryopreserve costs a little bit more, but you truly are getting something a little bit more. And if you have an infectious keratitis, that's what you wanna be using in my opinion, when it states in the package insert, do not use on an infectious keratitis. And is filamentary keratitis a code that is covered under insurance for an amniotic membrane? Um, I'm going to say, yes, I have a billing person. Um, if it's not dry, eye could be mm -hmm. used. The underlying mm -hmm. condition could be used rheumatoid arthritis. Um, I've never had a problem, uh, in Pennsylvania in my insurance is not getting it covered for filamentary keratitis. There's a cornea defect usually. So you can use it under some type of cornea defect, filamentary keratitis, the underlying condition, um, dry eye, 
Um, so I'm going to say filamentary keratitis, yes, but if not, you can get it covered some the, another way. Hey, very good. And it looks like you got another 100%, Greg. You know, somebody learned something, everybody learned something. Perfect. That's awesome. All right. Well, you know, it was kind of a mishmash of different technologies, kind of a little change of tradition. So with that being said, um, looks like we got all the questions answered. Jennifer, you sent me a private question. I'm going to read as Joe's wrapping up here. Um, I'm going to, 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 to reply back um, and uh, you can email me or call me and we can chat. She's asking about the different uh, vitamins that I was using to reverse. Uh, so with that being said, thank everyone for, uh, for attending uh, ocular disease interpretation, utilization, uh, new technologies uh, and old technologies.